And so it stores minerals, and so it stores the most popular one is calcium. And for this recording, I started a little late. Know what axial bones, how many we have, how many appendicular we have, and know which bones fall under the umbrella of axial and which ones fall under the umbrella of appendicular. And that's really all we need to know for that region. And lastly, don't forget ligaments are what connect bone to bone. Tendons are what connect muscle to bone. So with that, they provide support, keeping us up, upright and keeping uh, us from being just a sack of a bag of organs and keeping you know, supporting and protecting even precious organs with a rib cage protecting our precious brain with a skull and it stores mineral and something that it stores in particular is calcium you your body stores calcium through the use or with its bone with your bones that's why they always say drink a lot of milk because it has a lot of calcium milk is good for bones for that reason it also you will see in a second that bones in themselves they have a hollow center and that hollow center has marrow in it and some of it that marrow has what you know as fat cells or adipose adipose tissue and so our bones store energy molecules as well our bones are a site for red blood cell production or blood cells in general that we possess all the ability to make blood cells in our bones it provides protection that one's a little bit obvious right it's a hard outer shell for our brain a rib cage for our for our precious heart and lungs and then it also provides leverage for movement When we think to ourselves, this is a sort of an infograph just to show you when we compare what the bone is actually made out of, that we see that its inorganic component is going to be calcium. The second highest is going to be phosphate. But otherwise, 99% of your body's calcium is stored in bones. And that's really the only thing I kind of want to draw your attention to. Carbonate is something that is very relevant in physiology not really relevant in anatomy, but it's something to keep in mind that when you get to physio, that the carbonate, this, this term is gonna give you sort of a little bit PS, PTSD when you get to physio, but 80% of it, it's the source of the body's carbonate comes from bones. Don't really need to know it for our class or even our exam, just want you to keep that in mind. And then the, one, the other one that's relevant is that phosphate, such a useful inorganic molecule, 99% of it, is sequestered in our bones and so that's the most relevant facts that we need calcium and phosphate being the two most highly concentrated inorganic molecules can be found within bones the rest of it is a little bit extra that you do not need for our class and so with that there are a few ways that you're going to see that calcium is regulated in the body. It can be regulated by the kidneys, but not relevant for our class. It can be regulated by the intestines. So as you're consuming food, sometimes your body recognizes, oh, my person has too much calcium. You know what? Just, let, just have them defecate it out. We don't need it. And the kidneys can make you sort of urinate it out. And But the bones, how do the bones release it? It's as simple as understanding our cells. We know osteoblasts and osteocytes. Osteoblasts, let the bee remind you that osteoblasts build bone. They build it up. And then now we're going to learn about a new cell called osteoclast. They crush. I like to use the C to remind me of that. They destroy bone or crush it, right? And they erode it. They secrete acid, break it apart, and that's how they release calcium. So calcium actually it forms into a solid into your as a bone in, as into your bones as a solid. And when you need it, your cells erode your bone and break it apart, and then it releases it into the bloodstream for a, a available form of calcium that can be released into the bloodstream. But osteoblasts, they use calcium to build it right back up. Like they use that calcium, they build it into the bone, and we'll see it with pictures right now. But that's how bones maintain calcium levels, and that's what that, that's what will be relevant for our exam. Now, in our journey last week of bones, there's a lot of things that 
we worry we learned to give you a lot of bone so that you have a lot of these examples so that you know that there's families or classifications of bones and so for example some that you are familiar with suture right sutures were those tiny grooves that connected those cranial bones those bones that actually um you know link the uh the the cranial cavity bones together and so what we encounter is there are going to be some bones that originate between the sutures and this bone for example doesn't belong to this parietal bone it doesn't belong to this occipital bone it's sort of its own little island and so we refer to those little tiny bones as sutural bones sutural bones the next one we have our flat bones all the ones that we learned our frontal our parietal our occipital when we were if we looked at them separately you would see that they're very flat sort of like a little like a plate like con only slightly concave and so these are considered flat bones because of that sh very shape and that's really just really it so just make sure you know an example like a cranial bone would fit into that the vertebras you learn about, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, those are all irregular bones because they don't really have just one consistent shape. Our short bones, we learned the little carpal bones, these little stone-like bones that are in our palmar region. These are going to be the short bones of our body. One, our patella is considered a sesamoid. Not really much I can give you as to like what a sesamoid means. It doesn't really relate to sesame seeds. But otherwise, sesamoid, an example of sesamoid, the only one we really have is our patella. And yeah, it's the only one I'm going to require you to know. Just the ones that are in these boxes. And then long bones, we have our femur as the more popular one and also the humerus. And this is going to be a topic that we're going to see in a second that we examine what makes long bones unique. We don't really go into too much as to how do these bones form, but we do go into how long bones form so that we can see how osteoblasts, how osteocytes and osteoclasts come together to actually uh, to work together to actually hold bones to make bones and uh, utilize them to store calcium and that's really it. long bones just called that because of their length but just keep in mind that this is a long bone these two are long bones and even your metacarpals because of their shape they have a shaft in a sense are considered long bones Now, this is the segment that I mean. This segment can be summarized as being called a sort of long bone anatomy. But long bone anatomy, long bone features, because we're going to analyze all the components of a bone using a long bone. And so with that, some words, epiphyses, metaphyses, and diaphyses. When you look at this region here, of the part in the bones, there are regions to this bone. The region up top is called epiphyses. And I'm going to be more precise here. The ends are called epiphyses. Epiphyseal, you can see that's going to be the key word here. Epiphyses is also going to be down here. And I'm going to have to rely on this image here. Epiphyses. So epiphyses relies to this entire proximal region and also this entire distal region. More appropriately, something that your publisher didn't write here is that here this should say proximal, proximal epiphyses, because this is heading towards the trunk of the body, proximal epiphyses. And this bottom region should be called distal epiphyses because it's approaching the toes, right, distal. And so everything within this boundary, everything within this range is considered part of your epiphyses. So you're going to see a lot of the terms are going to be like epiphyseal artery, epiphyseal line, epiphyseal plate. And then the metaphyses is just going to be the region, everything that's found within here. In your lab exam, you learned about external bone markings. You learned about the greater trochanter, the lesser trochanter a little bit lower, the femur head, the neck. 
and the shaft overall. And But the generality is that all those features exist within the epiphyses if you are within this bracket. You learned about the condyles at the very bottom, the medial condyle and the lateral condyle, meaning the medial condyle of the tibia and the lateral condyle of the tibia, the bone below it. Also, those bone markings are found within the epiphyses. So the epiphyses is just a range of space. And it's not just the external part, it's also the internal portion. And that's what's different about lab and lectures. Now we're really learning about this entire region without really caring too much about those bone markings. So with that, metaphyses is going to be this region right in between. It cuts between the shaft or intervenes or interferes between the shaft region and what you can consider as sort of the ends of the bone. So metaphyses is just this tiny little portion here. And then diaphyses can also has usually be interchanged. They usually you'll see it sometimes referred to as the shaft of the bone. But I like the word diaphyses better because, again, it refers more to the inside as well. And I always feel like shaft sort of refers to the entire um, shape and uh, integrity that that long uh, part of the bone gives. But diaphyses really implies the space inside as well. But anywho, now... You've already seen the tissue compact bone. And just as a refresher, it's this one that you learned about in our connective tissue pa uh, papers. Let's get there. Here. Compact bone. You've learned this one in the microscope in your lab manual. It was pictured as this. This is your Com your bone tissue. More specifically, this should have always been labeled compact bone. Compact bone, because you have two types. And bring coming into our third lab exam, some things that we have to come back to, you're going to see this make a resurgence. The compact bone region, this is going to be what we saw, or we, we saw again in that previous exam, but you can see that this is going to be compact bone. And then you're going to see another word called spongy bone. This looks entirely different from this one. But if we look at what actually makes the, this tissue, osteocyte and osteoblast, they make this tissue and they also make this tissue. So now, what is the difference between compact bone and spongy bone? Compact bone makes the outer perimeter of the actual bone itself. We may, in our heads, maybe never really saw when we were eating chicken bones, because I know a lot of us don't just bite a chicken bone and, you know, start chewing it like a dog. You know, we're not, we don't eat that part of the bone. But if you actually break a bone in half, you know, next time I challenge you to eat chicken legs, just break one in half, and you'll see that the outer layer of it is incredibly tight and compact like an encasement. Compact bone is found on the outer ends of bone, completely cylindrical around it, completely like a pipe, the metal part of a pipe, the outside is compact bone. And then the inside where water travels through is considered spongy bone. Everything down this center in here is considered spongy bone and named after the fact that if you look at the texture, it looks very spongy. We took our bone boxes back, but we still have some vertebra that are still real. And you can see that some of those bones that you were looking at, when you look at the inside, it looked very spongy. And so this is why it's called spongy bone. And so when we say that we're looking at a microscope slide like this one, the one that we explored originally in our original connective tissue chapter, this was an example of compact bone. And just as we even introduced a little bit of a fact as well, that we know that for the most part, all that with the way osteocytes make bone is that they use collagen. They used collagen, but then they also use calcium. So we're seeing how they combine calcium salts with collagen, and that's what makes bone so so hard and that's why the collagen doesn't turn so hard in cartilage it doesn't turn so hard in dense regular and dense irregular because it doesn't add that calcium salt to make it tough so with that
this word articular cartilage. You had learned about hyaline cartilage and hyaline cartilage was a type of tissue. Oh, sorry. Gotta, gotta put these on do not disturb. There we go. And oh, back to this. And so here, articular cartilage now, this is going to be this region here at the very top. This is going to be where the bone meets another bone. You also encounter it here. And really, you encounter it on a lot of bones when they're going to meet another bone. You have to sort of think about it like, uh, like a cover to protect wear and tear. Because this is a solid material, right? This is a damaging material. And so your body compensates for it so that if it inter interacts with any bone on this side, that they both are covered by a protective like layer of tissue, of cartilage tissue, in order to prevent wear and tear on bones. And so that's what articular cartilage means. And that's why it covers portions of the epiphyses. So again, the word articulate means for one bone meets another one. And, I, like, I know you're probably sick of me doing this, but you've already learned that material as well. Hyaline cartilage, as an example. And I think that's the only one we learned, right? Yes, that's the only one. And so here our hyaline cartilage is the one of the examples of cartilage that is on the surface of that epiphyses, preventing wear and tear from bones articulating together. Anything else to add here? Now, inside. The inside is called spongy bone. Spongy bone, based off of the look of it. But in that space, because it's not just spongy bone, there's a fluid or there's a matrix or there's other things inside that can fit within that space. That space is referred to as medullary cavity. The word medulla in Latin you'll always come to see, usually means inner layer. Inner, medulla. It'll come up when we go over the kidneys. It'll come back when we go over brain. It even was in skin when we discuss the medulla of hair, as an example. Medulla. The word medulla always just means, in general, an inner layer. Not the most outer layer, but an inner layer. Usually a medulla will be followed by a cortex. You'll tend to see that trend. And so, just as an FYI. And so, in that medullary cavity, you have two types of bone marrow. You can find red bone marrow, and you can find yellow bone marrow. What's the difference? The difference is simple. Pay attention to the name. Red bone marrow is involved in the formation of red blood cells. It's where you have the stem cells for red blood cells. Yellow bone marrow, remember that in all our diagrams, Fat cells has always been pictured as yellow. And so that's going to be adipose tissue. The other tissue that you've learned about as well. So you can see how anatomy is such a tissue-based, even though nobody really wants to go over the tissues, it's really something very relevant. Adipose tissues was made by adipocytes, which were cells that really only exist to have a nucleus, a tight pushed against the corner, and then it has a vacuole storing a bunch of lipids in order to store a lot of energy for your body. And so when it comes to bone structure, you have yellow bone marrow, in, uh, which contains mainly adipose tissue. Now, all things in anatomy, all things that are cellular, when there's mitosis, when there's cells involved, we always need to keep in mind that they need nutrients from your food. They also need gases from the external environment. So your respiratory puts gases into your, blood, into your bloodstream. Your digestive system puts food or nutrients into your blood vessels. And so those blood vessels need to find their way into their bone. And what we see is that bone has very specific areas for innervation. If you're not used to this word, innervation is a common way to say, and I'm just going to start adapting it now before we get into more complicated topics, is that artery, vein, those are blood vessels in a spot. In other words, innervate means to have blood vessels 
in a place, in a location. You can use this word with nerve cells. So if I say the nerves innervate this little region here, that means that they enter and they're serving that little spot. So these blood vessels that we're about to learn about, the nutrient artery and the nutrient vein, those are going to be innervate the bone through the ep in the epiphyses. And so we refer to this as a nutrient foramen or the tiny little opening. I'm looking for a little picture, at least so I can use it. And oh, here, sorry. When we look at this little region here, this, let me put it in the center. This little region here, there's a little opening or a little hole. Remember that the word foramen meant opening or hole. And so a nutrient artery and a nutrient vein make their way in the diaphyses, I misspoke in this earlier on, I said epiphyses, but I meant, sorry, diaphyses, that the nutrient artery and vein innervate the bone inside of a foramen or an opening in the bone in the diaphyses. And you can see now all these blood vessels and all these nerves can serve inside of the medullary cavity, providing the lipids so that all the yellow bone marrow in here can store it in, as fat cells. The adipose can take, you know, store it in their vacuoles. And then all the red blood cells that are going to be forming in these areas for red bone marrow, they're going to receive all the healthy, rich oxygen supply, nutrient supply to make more cells. And so that's really just the relevance of that. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how um, blood gets through the edges well, because it does make a difference. And then lastly, this I sort of wish had uh, the designation diaphysy, so I'm going to add it myself here. And then the metaphysis is going to have its own innervation, and those are going to be the metaphyseal artery and veins entered through there. So the nice thing is, is the only real questions I kind of ask here are, where can we find the innervation of the nutrient artery and vein in bones, and where can we find the metaphyseal artery and vein? You know where one is, and so you, the other one is going to be located here in the diaphyses. This little bit of a complication. This little segment here, we have an epiphyseal artery and vein found there as well, but I don't really ask you anything there. But just keep in mind that your metaphyseal artery and vein will eventually give rise to arteries that will serve the epiphyses. And if you look at this bone, you'll notice that this bone is a humerus bone. It's not the same as this bone, but it has the same objects, the same um, structures you care about. In other words, it has a nutrient foramen. It has a metaphyseal foramen to allow those nutrient arteries and veins to enter, respectively. And now, when we look at our compact bone, when we compare it to that center, this is where that center of that bone is, the spongy bone. And this outer region is our compact bone. This is what we've already sort of been introduced to. And what you have to draw your eyes to are these circular objects called osteons, because that will serve as your memory, as to uh, hopefully refresh your memories. That when we looked at bones, one of the key features was always seeing these osteons, seeing these cylindr cylindrical objects here. And so if we translate it over, that's what we're seeing in this little cartoon image or this diagram here. And so, <clears throat> now we have a population of cells that we care about. We have osteogenic cells, we have osteoblasts, we have osteocytes, and osteoclasts. Now, osteogenic cells are going to be cells that produce, that are sort of going to be like a uh, origin, like a, the, the, what's the word, like, uh, with the stem cell. How do I clarify this in a more uh, easier, easy, easier way? The cells, the proj the cell original cells, they can they they can differentiate or turn into something else. In 
Latin. I don't know how many of us remember from our cell. We talked about the word differentiation. Now, what these cells do, and there's an, an order to this. Osteogenic cells will then be, can become osteo, will become osteoblasts. And then we have our osteoblasts will turn into osteocytes. And osteogenic cells can technically turn into osteoclasts. Sorry, it went the wrong way. There we go. And so osteogenic cells are sort of a cell that are mitotically active, and that's all mesenchymal cells are. And I'll actually uh, do it a little bit, a little bit easier explanation, something that sounds a little more familiar. When we look at, when we were looking at our layers for skin, we saw that these layers, the basal cells, were the ones that were mitotically giving rise to cells. And how are they doing so? Through mitosis. And so as these cells migrated upwards, they were undergoing changes. It's in the same theme that these stem cells, the osteogenic cells, when they undergo mitosis, one of those daughter cells will probably turn into an osteoblast. And osteoblasts are responsible for building bone. And so these cells are always located on the lining of your compact bone and the inside of the bone. And let's get into those two phrases or those two uh, concepts. When we look at our bone, on this very surface out here, that is considered your periosteum. We're going to have to give that a name here. And this periosteum, you have to think about like the word perimeter, around. It's saying around the bone. When you look at a bone, that white part that you see, that is the periosteum, the outer covering, kind of like your, the phone case on your phone. Every bone has an encasement around it called periosteum. So we have cells that can give rise to bone builders located along the edge of the outside of cells in the periosteum. And that's what this note is trying to say. Endosteum is going to endosteum pardon is going to be the opposite of periosteum. It's not going to be found around on the outside, but it's going to be found here on the inside. This one down here is going to be the endosteum. And so you have these same osteoprogenitor cells. You have these same cells located on the outside lining and the lining of the inside of our medullary cavity. And that's what endosteum is. And then this is a little bit extra than I care for you to have, but they're by our, the blood vessels that have innervated through these foramen, through the metaphyseal foramen or through the nutrient foramen. But otherwise... Now, if we go to our osteoblasts now. Our osteoblasts, they come from our osteoprogenitor cells. And what they lay down is something what you can call as like phase one bone, I like to call it. Phase one bone. Because bone needs to be laid out first in a very so like a softer way, in a way that hasn't fully solidified yet. And we consider or we call that osteoid. And so osteoid or osteoblast, what they create is osteoid. They're responsible for making the material of collagen mixed with a calcium salt. And so this is sort of like first phase bone. That's kind of why you see the first phase bone here. It hasn't fully solidified into what you know as bone yet, that hard material. And the process of making osteoid is called osteogenesis. Sometimes you will see it as ossification. 
When it has laid down its osteoid, then it's going to deposit its calcium salts and convert it to what you know as bone. So if you think about this, this down here, this is what bone looks like, like mature bone in a way, like mature bone material is the, the harder stuff, the stuff that you're familiar with as what bone is. But first you lay down the osteoid and then they add the calcium salt and then eventually this will look like or this will look like this this sort of eventually will look complete and so osteoid is sort of again like what an unmineralized matrix and then adding the mineral of calcium converts osteoid to what you consider as what you know as bone now i mentioned up here osteoblasts turn to osteocytes and the reason is because they get trapped like bone is not a fluid material once they lay this out sometimes they just get stuck within their own space and they get completely enveloped and once they are completely enveloped and they are trapped in a little cavity of their own making they turn to osteocytes and osteocytes are the ones responsible for maintaining the bone around them where it was relevant for us is that we had to learn that osteoblasts, when we were looking at our pictures, that each one of these here was a little cavity called lacuna. And within that lacuna, there were osteocytes. And at, during, for the exam, I didn't care if you wrote osteoblast or osteocytes, because for the most part, as they're making bone, and as this one used to, bone used to be this small, and then as it was migrating upwards, you know, this one became trapped. And then eventually this one became trapped. So they all started off as osteoblasts. But once they became trapped, they became osteocytes. And it's their role to maintain the bone around them. And so osteocytes can be sort of considered maintainers of bone tissue. Maintainers of bone tissue. But they started off as osteoblasts. And maybe now you kind of understand why I never really cared if you use the word fibroblast or fibrocyte because at the end of the day even a fibroblast will turn to a fibrocyte a chondroblast will turn into a chondrocyte for the same reason it's sort of like once they built it they're stuck there and they gotta just maintain it and it's the same th theme overall but uh, we're keeping it easy and we're so we're really only starting with um osteocytes and then we learn chondroblasts and chondrocytes but anywho and so now osteocytes, they are considered mature bone cells because now they're not responsible for dividing. You can't divide once you're trapped inside of your little cavity, inside of your lacuna. You're stuck in there. So you can't really build any more in there. Otherwise, you're just going to entrap yourself. And you, they don't want to do this because you'll notice that they have these little highways here called caniculi named after canals and they have little canals here you have one osteocyte you have the second one over here and you can see that they communicate or can do chemical communication they can share materials through bones so even though bone or the outer layer of bone this region is compact this compact bone even though it looks like this and it looks very solid and it gives bone a very solid integrity there's still a lot of cracks through them so that the osteocytes can share fluid material nutrients can make it to them and so this region even though it looks like dead solid metal material like this you know it's technically built with a lot of cracks with all these osteocytes communicating with each other through caniculi all of them having to use caniculi because they're trapped within lacuna And so that's what makes osteocytes particularly unique. And again, I'd like to say they maintain it. They maintain it. Lamellae, for us, is nothing but the organization of the matrix. And more, I'm going to say that even more simplier. It's the arrangement of the bone around them. And I know that a lot of people might not like that explanation, but it's easier to understand when you think about it this way. When you look at, for example, these osteocytes, these osteocytes are all creating or maintaining the bone around them. The osteoblasts were out here and during puberty, they migrated outwards, leaving these osteocytes out here in the dust to just maintain in their lacuna. 
until you know until they were replaced or you'd get damaged and so this these osteoblasts migrated from here leaving behind all of these osteocytes but in their wake they create different layers you'll notice that the arrangement of the bone is different out here than it is over here here it does it in a circular manner and over here sometimes you get little leftover regions little leftover regions larger leftover regions and you can see that it's just laid out differently so when you think to yourself the word lamellae now this word lamellae it's just the arrangement of the matrix we're going to keep it simple this one here and i'm pretty sure this comes up in the next one let me double check Yes, it does. I'll just I'll mention it in the next one. But you'll notice that it's the arrangement of the bone in this region. That's what the lamellae is. More on that in a few minutes, in a minute. Just want to finish this page. Now, osteoclasts. Now, osteoclasts, if you can hold on, you can use this word to remind you of two things. Crush to break down. Clastos is Latin for bro breaking, so that's why osteoclasts break bone apart. And so you can think about it to yourself, crushing break to break it down, or even for calcium. I like to use it to remind me of that as well, because if your body needs some calcium, the osteoclasts break apart the bone, all that solid matrix, they break it down with acid, and they release all the stored minerals in our case calcium for stored minerals calcium is really the key player here that we really care about and phosphate for the most part but calcium is the one i want you to hold on to and calcium is going to be released from this matrix because of our little osteoclast so if your body needs some calcium it commands these osteoclasts to break it down and release that calcium into the bloodstream we call the act of breaking things down lysis in latin that's why if you remember we have hydrolyse no we don't do that one sorry we have lysosomes lice would mean because they digest or break things down inside of a cell so the word lice means to break down osteo means bone break bone apart osteolysis and so make sure we know our four categories of cells And so now if we compare compact and spongy bone, we saw a major difference that everything we learned about right now, we learned on the surface how compact bone is made. And I don't really care too much for us to really know how spongy bone is made, but if you were to actually read up on it, you would see it's the exact same thing. That osteogenic cells give rise to osteoblasts, osteoblasts, create the material that you know as spongy bone it'll look like this instead of like this and eventually osteocytes will be trapped inside of them and they'll be maintaining it inside of the spongy bone but otherwise it's the same narrative and so i don't really like to test on it there's enough to test for this exam so with that do not forget compact bone is going to be the outer layer. I'm going to start off with this image that if you grab a humerus or a femur bone, you make a slice of it like if you were cutting a tree down and you stare straight at it, this is what you would be seeing. The outside perimeter of it is compact bone. The outer lining of it is periosteon. The inner line, lining of this is called endosteon. And so that's the organization that we're paying attention paying attention to now that the unit of compact bone made by our osteocytes is the osteon they used to be called the haversian system but that's not really relevant i prefer osteon just because it sort of matches in theme osteo being latin for bone or a reference to bone and then we have our lamellae now our lamellae Lamellae is the arrangement of this matrix. So you can see that this matrix goes entirely along the length of the bone, that if you follow this, it would make a complete circle around the bone. This lamellae is called circumferential lamellae, right? It sounds like circular, and that's because it's a complete circle around the entire bone. In other words, one last time, 
if you were to draw a line around this, whoops, better connect my stuff in a second. If you were to draw a line around all of this, it'd be all around the edge here. But then it changes here down the center. And so, our osteons are going to be, oops, oops. Our osteons are going to be all of these cylindrical ones. And so you can see that the lamellae or the matrix around it is circular and tiny cylinder cylinders. That if you pulled one out, you would see that this is what gives bone its rigidity or its strength. That it's sort of like what functions like one little the inner layer is sort of embedded with the next layer and then that next layer is embedded with the next layer and what you end up with is sort of a gear like a gear like configuration like when you think about gears right they sort of force the next one to move and in this case they're always just sitting very firmly attached that's why some fractures can be worse than others like if you're in a car accident and if you think about like a towel that you know you rinse a towel if you break your bone you get a torsion fracture meaning the fractures like this those are incredibly difficult to repair because your bones and the, the compact regions are sort of nicely cemented and geared together so getting them to heal again after a, like a fracture that sort of twisted like this is tough as opposed to if you break a nice clean break then you know you can just put them together and they sort of just sort of eventually find each other and they're able to sort of mend over time but when it comes to torsion fractures you're breaking apart a very solid foundation uh, for bone and so we have our, our the strength of bone or the compact region, we really have to be grateful for these osteons for it. And all of these osteons come with the central canal, which is where blood vessels and the little yellow one is nerve. So blood vessels innervate these areas. You can see that they travel along the length of bone. In other words, they travel downwards. And that they travel in this direction along the compact bone regions. Because all we're talking about right now is compact bone. And so these central canals provide vascularity for bone. So you can see why bone is even considered a connective tissue because it even links blood vessels and nervous tissue together. And so on our lab manual, these were the central canals that you were seeing, these little center circles. You can see a bunch of them here on the compact bone. So they all have blood vessels and nerves running through all of them. And now our lamellae. Now, these lamellae that make up the osteons, these are called concentric lamellae. Concentric lamellae. And I'm not seeing it on our list for some reason. I might have cut it out by accident. Yeah, these lamellae that make up the osteons, I'm going to label it on this one so you can do so as well if you'd like to. This whole region is considered concentric lamellae. concentric lamellae all the ones that wrap around the osteon and then the ones that go all the way around the perimeter are called circumferential and then the last ones we need to go over are the interstitial lamellae these are going to be the ones that are found in between <laughs> uh, thank you found in between spaces they are found between both of these so they are found between the circumferential and the concentric they're the ones that don't really have any unique shape they're just sort of stuck they never got to be part of an osteon they never got to be part of the circumferential they're stuck in between interstitial lamellae and so that's a, just the three arrangements of the lamellae all right and anything else to add? Just perforating canals, and that's it. And so when we look at our compact bone, we saw our cent oops, sorry. we saw our con our central canals. And if we follow our central canals, you'll notice that there are some that go in a perpendicular or a rectus or what's it more appropriate, in an X angle, right? They go horizontal to the ground, and these are referred to as perforating canals. 
perforating canals. And they eventually can lead out either whether they're going to go into the inside of the bone, inside of the medullary cavity, or they're going to travel to the outside of the bone and join the rest of the vascularity of the body or join the other blood vessels outside of the bones. Do not forget the spongy bone is the segment in the center, the innermost layer. And now when we examine these very closely, these shapes, this spongy bone is referred to as trabiculae. Trabiculae. All these little spicules or all these little spiky looking or these little uh, cavern system that you find on the inside of spongy bone is referred to as trabiculae. It is another form of lamellae, just like the ones up, up top, but it just arranges that bone in a more open net-like network. There is no blood vessels within that matrix. All the blood vessels sort of go from the compact bone and end here. They sort of end or sort of allow, but they have capillaries on these ends and they sort of drop off the materials that they need in that space. But otherwise, there's not, you're not gonna find full-blown blood vessels going straight through these regions or through the medullary cavity of the spongy bone. And other than that, and now locations for red bone marrow. When we discuss our red bone marrow, our spongy bone, and something I gotta clarify here, something that's not written here, but I think I'm gonna wait to add it. Let's keep it simple the inside of the spongy trabiculae. I wanna show you where the location of red bone marrow and yellow bone marrow is, but I kinda of would prefer to use a picture for that, and I don't have one of those in your, in your slides, so I'll pull one up during our little break. All right, let's take a quick break. That's for the first uh, two hours. I would say just uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes before, and then we'll do another little lecture, the second lecture, and then uh, we'll take a longer lunch break, and lab today will be a little more fun, a little more active, and. Um, yeah, but let's uh, take a 15 minute break. And I left the folder. I was going to give you back your lecture exams and your lab exams, and I left the folder. I was going to turn around. I did turn around, and that's why I was a little late today because I turned around. I was like, let me go get their exams. I thought I would have been like another 15 minutes. So I was like, forget it. I'll just bring them next time.